Welcome to The Legal View. I'm David Hogg, and this is Aaron Gartland. Tonight our guest is Dothan attorney Christy Kirkland. Christy's going to talk with us about immigration issues. And on tonight's edition of The Legal Brief, David and I will be discussing the importance of preparing a client for their deposition and how that relates specifically to some cases that we're currently handling where that has been a very important aspect of the case. American law is complex and not always easily understood, so a little help and advice can go a long way. The attorneys of Hogg and Gartland Law Firm in Dothan present Legal View. The Legal View with Hogg and Gartland. Christy, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. Uh, Christy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Give our viewers uh, the background of uh, where you are from and where you went to school. Sure, absolutely. I went to the University of Alabama School of Law. Um, I'm licensed in both Alabama and Florida as an attorney, and I practice mostly personal injury, um, immigration, divorce cases, that sort of thing here in Dothan. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about immigration issues tonight. Tell our viewers how you uh, came to be involved in immigration law. Absolutely. At my um, first employer out of law school encouraged me to go and try to learn as much as I could about immigration law as we had very few immigration lawyers in this area. Um, and there was a growing need that they saw that we needed immigration lawyers. So they sent me to a few classes and I learned quite a bit and picked it up there. And the Wiregrass does have a growing Hispanic community. Um, have you found there to be uh, quite a few uh, issues involving immigration here in, in Dothan and the Wiregrass? Absolutely. I have both employers and immigrants needing help um, come to me on a regular basis. And there have been uh, articles uh, recently about Alabama's immigration law, I think a recent decision. Uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about Alabama's immigration law. Sure. Alabama's immigration law is one of the toughest in the country. In fact, it's been called the toughest in the country by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, it imposes um, many different restrictions, basically making it more illegal to be in the country illegally. Um, federal law already made it illegal to be in the country without permission. Um, this law makes it even more difficult. Um, it, it actually um, lays out that Police officers can ask an immigration status during a traffic stop. There, it's 76 pages worth. Um, some of the biggest concerns right now are, and that were upheld yesterday by Judge Blackburn in, in Birmingham, um, are the provisions that relate to reporting of schools um, on how many illegal immigrant children are in their schools or how many children of illegal parents are in their schools. Um, there's also the issue of contracts. Now, Judge Blackburn also upheld that um, didn't enjoin the part of the law that allows, um, that makes any contract with an illegal alien um, unenforceable. It's basically void now, any contract anyone has with someone who's in this country illegally. Um, there are a bunch of different aspects of the law. Like I said, it's 76 pages. Um, clergy in the area were concerned because there's um, an aspect to it that prevents harboring or transporting anyone that you know to be an illegal alien. The definition of harboring was something that everyone was very unsure about. Luckily, that is part of the um, law that Judge Blackburn didn't join until she's able to actually rule on that part of the law. Well, now, Christy, what, what we're talking about here for everyone that doesn't know, and David and I aren't that familiar with it because we just uh, do not really handle immigration type cases, but we're talking about a, a piece of legislation or a law that was enacted by our Alabama legislature, right? Exactly. And when, was it, when did this law go into effect? This law was enacted in June. Um, it technically was supposed to go into effect on September 1st. Uh, about two days before that, Judge Blackburn, uh, there were several lawsuits filed against it. Judge Blackburn issued an injunction over the entire law. Then yesterday, on September 28th, she um, issued a ruling that limited the injunction to only specific provisions of the law. Um, therefore, 
certain aspects of it, especially aspects that were sort of expected to be upheld concerning employment of illegal aliens, uh, she's enjoined. Um, but other parts that were expected to be struck down that she hasn't enjoined. So it's, it's very unusual as to what we're seeing right now. Well, Christy, um, is there any change with this uh, court action over concerns that, uh, say, farmers may have who are um, employing uh, persons to work in their fields or maybe a construction uh, contractor who has people working a crew, building a house. Uh, is anything significantly different now as a result of this ruling? Absolutely. Um, E-Verify has gone into effect and E-Verify is basically an extension of the old I-9 program. Um, program. Um, as you know, most of the time when you have to, when you accept employment with someone, you do an I-9 form. Um, the I-9 was put into place by the Immigration and Nationality, excuse me, not the Immigration and Nationality Act, um, it's IRCA, which it occurred during the Reagan administration, um, was, it basically said, we need to make sure that everyone who is working in this country is working legally. Um, E-Verify is an extension of the I-9 program. E-Verify requires um, an employer to go online through the Social Security website or the IRS website and verify electronically that the documents that they're given pursuant to an I-9 are actually real documents. So that's part of it. That will affect and, workers. And, and you're saying that it's putting the burden on the individual employees to do that? It, it's, put, it's putting it on I'm the sorry, employer. On the employees. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, there have been part of the that what was enjoined yesterday are the restrictions on day laborers, which is helpful to the farmers. If you know somebody just shows up at their farm and wants to work a day, they are allowed to employ those people as independent contractors based on the injunction that was issued yesterday. But um, any other sort of employment, it seems like, is going to have to go through E-Verify. Well, how, how does an employer, how does an individual employer or a small business go about doing that? Going about E-Verify? Yes. That's actually pretty easy to register for online with the Social Security Administration. The problem is it's hard for a small business employer to get legal immigrant help that's going to be able to help them, like in our agriculture business here. Sure. Um, because there are two different visa paths that they can follow, and each visa path requires the, lay, um, requires the employer to get certification from the Department of Labor that the help is actually needed, that they can't um, find help in this area, that they can't find Americans willing to do the jobs for the wages that are required. Um, there are a lot of hoops to jump through to get legal employment in the agricultural business. Therefore, you know, when I have a small farmer come to me and I tell him it's going to cost probably between $5,000 to $7,000 to get legal workers in, he can't afford it's that. It's cost prohibitive, basically. Exactly. Is that $5,000 to $7,000 per individual or? Um, it really depends. Sometimes you can use the same um, Department of Labor certification over and over for an individual. That's where a lot of the money comes in. But it can cost that much because you're having to pay that filing fees. You're having to pay that much to the government itself, not to mention having to pay an attorney to do the work for you because the law is so massive that it's nearly impossible on the federal level to do it without an attorney. It's not something that someone can just go in and do themselves. It's not like a small claims action or something. Well, you know, I know this is not really the only piece of legislation that our legislature has uh, ever passed without really uh, considering or it sometimes appears that, that all of the uh, aspects of how it would impact people, how it would negatively impact people and the general public, you know, that's not always considered. So what I want, or at least it doesn't look like it's always considered. Is that your impression of this law that, you know, the legislature, legislature didn't really consider all the ramifications that's that this my, would have? Absolutely, that's my impression of the law. I'm, I, I know several legislators myself, I've known them for several years, in fact, talked to one immediately after this law was passed and said, I don't think I'll got anyone that is that actually understands immigration law to talk to you about this. 
um, one of the aspects that disturbs me the most is that we didn't focus on what's going on with children um, who are illegal immigrants. Um, I got a call yesterday when this injunction came out, very bright, very smart young girl who's 12 years old and was concerned. Her family's had other contact with me regarding immigration issues. And she was born in Mexico, brought when she was two years old. And um, she wanted to know if it was safe for her to go to school today because of this requirement that teachers have to let people know. I can't believe I live in a state where a child's scared to go to school because of what the government has said we have to do. Well, and Christy, I think that would bring about some concerns that you mentioned with the clergy, mm -hmm. I guess the churches, the schools, about how, um, you know, what, it, what would be considered harboring. Exactly. You know, if, if a church or a school were to help a child in that situation, are they going to be looked at? as breaking the law and harboring Exactly, someone. and luckily Judge Blackburn did enjoin that part of the law yesterday with the harboring. She didn't enjoy the part with the school, so of course the child was scared if she went to school, mom and dad were going to get arrested. Sure. And she was going to end up arrested. Um, it's one thing to deal with schoolyard bullies, it's another thing to deal with that. Um, in terms of the clergy and the harboring, that's one of the things we still don't know. Um, with my law practice, um, that was an issue that I had, was if I have somebody that by virtue of my law practice, if someone's in deportation, I know they are illegally present in the country, but the United States government um, affords them the right to a trial and the right to be heard regarding that illegal the presence. Sure. Um, yet I can no longer contract with them, and this is as it stands, and it's possible that I could be in trouble for just letting them come into my law office and giving them a drink of water. Um, we don't know what harboring is considered. Um, a lot of the times I have to drop clients to New Orleans for deportation hearing, and that's even trying to get is, them out of the is country. That harboring? Exactly, sure. and transporting too. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's trying to help someone, that's trying to accomplish even the purpose of this law, which is a lot of the times I'm going down there to help somebody do what's called voluntary departure, which is they are leaving the country in a legal manner and acknowledging that they were illegally in this country. The law makes no distinction for that. Um, I've got other cases where, you know, women have been held by men who are being abusive to them um, that are American men who keep them in that abusive relationship by threatening them with um, their status. sure. And I'll just call ICE on you, I'll just call the police, you better not report this, the police will just take you away. Um, and while we have these, there are exceptions carved in for domestic violence and that sort of thing into the Alabama law, an illegal immigrant who has come here and can barely read is not going to read through 76 pages. All they've heard is that we are just going to deport anyone who's illegal in this in the state, you risk being sitting in jail and waiting for deportation if you call the police. Well, you know, Christy, I know in my experience over the years, I've uh, dealt with and, and, and represented people that I really had the impression that there was a legal avenue mm -hmm. to help them and would oftentimes try to uh, steer them toward mm -hmm. seeing an immigration lawyer but I always felt like there was um, possibly a level of trust that was not there with the system or, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, what would you say, uh, you know, could, could you comment on that? Sure, and, and that's been an issue in establishing my practice. Um, and as I tell everyone who comes in, I'm like a priest. You and I both know that being an attorney, we can't tell if someone, and in fact, this new law can't even make us tell that we know that someone is illegally present in this country. So we are bound ethically, we lose our jobs if we tell something that a client has told us in confidence and your immigration status is considered something that you told me in confidence. So um, you, know, you have avenues to go to the bar or that sort of thing if you need to, if I break your confidence and I'm not gonna lose my job just to tell somebody you're an illegal immigrant. Sure. Well, Christy, how can uh, people get in touch with you if they have questions about immigration status or the immigration law? Sure, they can call my office at 334-803-8228. 
Um, I also have a Spanish interpreter, uh, Margarita Crescent, and you can call her at 334-498-1939. And you can also email me at Christy, K-R-I-S-T-Y, at Kirkland Firm, K-I-R-K-L-A-N-D-F-I-R-M.com. Well, David, I'm glad we had Christy on the show tonight. I think that was very informative and, and certainly relevant to what's going on in the state right now. It was, and um, there's a big Hispanic population in the Wiregrass area. We come in contact with um, uh, immigrants all the time. They're hardworking people, and uh, it's, it's a, a big concern for folks in this area. Well, and I think it, it really affects people across the board because uh, consumers will be impacted by uh, this legislation as well as uh, your um, average small business owner. We're shooting tonight's program from the conference room of the beautiful Sanders House where Aaron and I have our offices and we've taken many depositions here in this conference room. We're going to talk tonight on the legal brief about what a deposition is and if you're going to give a deposition as a witness or as a party, how you should be prepared to give that deposition. Yeah, and, and basically what I wanted to talk about and really focus on David because I know it's something that has really uh, been an area of focus for us these past few weeks. We've had a lot of depositions going on. Is in particular just how important it is to prepare your client to give their deposition. Uh, a deposition is basically uh, an opportunity for the other side to get your testimony before trial and to find out not only what you're going to say when you get to court, but also to evaluate how you're going to testify as a witness. That, that's right. And in today's, uh, with technology available to today, uh, videoing depositions is becoming more common. So it's even more important to prepare the witness because that video deposition can be played back in court and if you change something that you've said during your deposition or if you appear uh, evasive uh, during your deposition, that could come out in court. So it's important for you to know how to give a deposition to be relaxed and to testify truthfully and how to testify in such a way that you don't uh, say things that you want to say but rather how you a answer the questions uh, and, and not give too much information. Well, you know, David, early in my career, I looked at a deposition, especially in an injury type case, an accident or injury case where my client was uh, injured um, in, in some type of accident through no fault of their own. I used to look at that deposition and think, well, hey, I, I'm representing a good, hardworking person. They didn't do anything wrong. You know, we don't have anything to hide, so just um, be polite you know, answer the question I asked, you know, don't elaborate unnecessary or answer anything that's not asked of you, and listen to me for my directions and any objections that I make, and for the most part, just tell the truth, we've got nothing to hide. And I think all of that's still important today, but after having years of experience, I know uh, more about it, and I now realize that that insurance defense lawyer walks in with an agenda and that agenda is to try to poke holes in your case to try to find any potential defenses that they can expose in an effort to uh, negate liability or to um, uh, eliminate liability or reduce their liability. So you really have to prepare that client to give their deposition or you're throwing them to the sharks. You know, if you don't give a good thorough preparation of all the aspects of the case. And I'd kind of like us to take a few minutes and elaborate on some of the important things that we're going to prepare our clients for before they go in for their deposition. Uh, you want me to testify truthfully in my deposition, right? Absolutely. Okay. But tell me what the important things that you need to cover with me to prepare me to give my deposition are. Well, David, we're gonna we would sit down 
and most likely it would be here in the conference room where their deposition would be given and you know would want to make you uh, feel comfortable with the environment and you know I want you to understand it's your deposition that you know we're in charge and we're not going to let anybody come in the conference room and bully you or try to run over you or uh, beat up on you in any, any way so at any time you know you need to take a break uh, during the deposition or we need to talk um, you know we you know want to make that clear that you know it's, it's your deposition if you need to take a break you know let me know uh, also of course like you said to tell the truth that to um, you know the uh, insurance adjuster and insurance lawyer the insurance defense attorney is going to be making judgments about you evaluating the case part of that would be based on your appearance so you want to come in you know maybe not necessarily in a, a suit and tie but come in you know professional uh, or you know I mean it's something that you're comfortable in you know to, to you know so everybody knows that you take the process serious you take giving your your deposition serious well, and that just shows respect also to the other parties and everyone there right absolutely and speaking of respect you know to show that you respect the the process and part of that that you know another thing that I would go over with you is to to be of course be respectful and not show any unnecessary emotion you know um, typically that's going to uh, hurt your case especially if that emotion is exaggerated or it's not genuine now you got to be yourself and some of these cases are emotional so naturally at times a client can't help but show some emotion but Aaron I'm mad about what happened why can't I just blast them right here during my deposition well sometimes that's exactly what the defense attorney is trying to make happen because if they can get you hot-headed and get you angry and upset and emotional you may say some things that aren't true or some things that play right into one of their defenses or something that they're trying to get you boxed in on and it's at times that we're tired when we get emotional um, when we're frustrated those are the times that we say things that might not make sense or that may come back to hurt us later. So we really try to keep the emotions in check. And, now, and a jury's not likely, as, as likely to like an angry person, right? That, that's right. Not gonna wanna help an angry person. That, that's, very, that's very possible. Uh, you, you know, David, some other things that are very important is, um, you know, if you're my client and I'm preparing you for your, to give your deposition, I'm going to want you to have some basic knowledge of the, the facts of your case, especially as it relates to the lawsuit that we filed. Now, you know, that sounds, um, that may sound a little bit, you know, ridiculous. How could you not know about the facts of your lawsuit? But what I mean, oftentimes corporations are sued. Um, several parties are named as defendants in a lawsuit and the last thing I want you to do as a client is be burdened with all the details and be expected to know all the intricate legal issues and facts and circumstances that are involved in your case but I want you to have a basic understanding of the theories of liability that we're suing for and also a basic understanding of the defendants in other words, I don't want you to come down and sit and give your deposition and say, well, I don't think that defendant did anything wrong. I don't know why they've been named as a defendant in, in the lawsuit. So I want you to be familiar with the uh, basic allegations that are involved in the lawsuit. And while it's perfectly understandable for you to say, I'm relying on the advice of my attorneys, you know, they're handling the legal or technical aspects of the case I would still want you to have a basic understanding of you know the theories of liability and why certain uh, entities or defendants are named certain people are named as defendants what claims we're making against who and why exactly 
Uh, also, and this is really where uh, it's, it's your opportunity in your deposition to talk about how you've been injured and damaged. In other words, if you've been in a wreck or you've been hurt on the job, I want you to come in that deposition and I want you to be prepared in your own words to talk about the day-to-day -day impact that that accident, that, that injury has had on your life. Uh, whether it's doctor visits, whether it's uh, pain and suffering and mental anguish, a loss of sleep, you know, stress, uh, that you're not able to play golf or you can't do the same job that you once did. Now, a couple of things that are important about your damages, and they're kind of at opposite ends of the spectrum. I want you to be, you know, truthful about it and not exaggerate anything. In other words, don't make the injury more than it is. If you can go to work and you're able to work, you need to come in and testify that you're able to go back to work. If you're able to work a half a day where you once could work a full day, you need to come in and, and, and be truthful and honest about how you've been damaged. But at the same time, I've seen people come in and in the office and act like Fortunately, this has never happened in a deposition, but I've had people come in the office and act like they can do all the same things that they did prior to their accident and their injury. And their friends and family are telling me they can't. So they're minimizing, they're actually minimizing their injuries and damages. So you want to be able to articulate and express how you've been impacted and again, not minimize it or exaggerate it. Um, also, Aaron, do you find it important for the witness to, and just talking about mechanics of giving a deposition, listen to the question before you start trying to Very answer Very basic, it. absolutely. Let the questioner, the attorney, finish answering, the, uh, asking the question. And focus on that question. And then listen to that question and think about what is it he's asking me. Yeah, and, 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 and answer the question. Don't elaborate, don't volunteer, don't lie, you know, don't speculate. Um, now, there probably are situations where it would come up and a client would pr probably need to speculate about something. And if that's the case, then I would tell them, you know, you need to convey that you're speculating or this is what you think happened, you know. So you're not necessarily boxed in when you're speculating, but generally, you just don't need to speculate. You need to only answer things that you know to be the truth. Thanks again to Christy Kirkland for being our guest tonight and talking about immigration issues. And of course, we would like to thank everybody for watching. Tune in next week to The Legal View. To submit legal questions you may have, email to Aaron at hoggartlandlawfirm.com. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Hogg and Gartland Law Firm and WDFX-TV, Fox 34. The Legal View with Hogg and Gartland.